review from last week, and actually the review isn't a review of what you got on your handout, it's, it's new stuff, but it, it's still sort of like a review, and I, it's some of the stuff that kind of got clipped on the, um, on the message last week, so I thought, wow, this is some good stuff, I don't want to go through this too fast, and there may be some encouraging things for you this week or something you can pull back out later on. So, in the book of Matthew, is a powerful passage, and that passage we looked at last week, and I believe it radiates hope all through it, although it's a small passage, do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? I shared with you last week, when I first looked at that, I was challenged, I was convicted right off the bat, and I sat downstairs in the office and I just cried. Because I I come to the conclusion that I don't love lost people like Jesus did. And part of hungering and thirsting after righteousness is to come to that hunger to see lost people repent, be uh, saved, be converted, and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So it says, we're blessed if we hunger and thirst after righteousness. And the blessing is we become filled. We become satisfied. I want to become satisfied with my love for lost people. I want to see them saved. We don't hunger. When we get to that point, we don't hunger anymore as the world hungers because our satisfaction has been met in Christ. Now, down through my life, I've hungered for different things. I've hungered for uh, building a home, drawing up the blueprints. i uh, when I was a kid, I collected coins, so there was a hunger for coins. I'd check out the prices, I'd, I'd spend time, I would buy things, I would sell things. But my hunger for Christ has caused those hungers to dissipate. In other words, I don't even care for them as I once did. Now, do I still care somewhat? Yeah, somewhat, it's, it pricks my interest, but I don't go out of my way to search those things out. So, when we look at hungering and thirsting, after righteousness, they both are evangelistic in uh, in, in our pursuit of those things. For those who don't know Christ, we want them to know Jesus. But the message also is, is, is anchored in progressive sanctification. In other words, as we progress in our relationship with Christ... We share with others the benefits, the rewards of thirsting and hungering after righteousness. We become an example to those who may still be hungering and thirsting after the things of this world. And as Christians, we do. So it's evangelistic, and it's also discipleship or progressive sanctification as an example to those who are in Christ. Now, in the book of Psalms, David says this, O God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary. David also says in the book of Psalms 42, As the deer pants for the water brooks, So pants my soul for you. Oh God, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God. I love David's emotions, his passion when he penned these words. Must have just been way out there. You you can almost feel the hunger and thirst that David had for a closer walk with God. These passages passages, this, the psalmist here, he embodies what it means to long for, to hunger, and thirst for righteousness. May we be like David. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you. As the deer pants for the water brook, so pants my soul for you, oh God. I love that. Do you have this longing? this passion, this deep sense of need 
for hunger and thirsting for righteousness. Is it something you cannot live without? Now, like I said, I, I got convicted with this. I want to have a greater hunger and a greater thirst for the things of God. And I, I tell you, that's what we as believers ought to be hungering after. We need to hunger after God on a daily basis. Every moment, every day, we ought to be hungering after God. Marsha and I was talking, uh, I think, yesterday, early yesterday on the phone about um, people doing knucklehead things. And they do. They just do knucklehead things. And she said something to me. She said, well, not everybody does knucklehead things. And she said, you don't do knucklehead things. And I said, well, I, I, I do. I said, sometimes when I talk with you, I don't think through what I'm saying and how I'm saying it, and I'm not sensitive to your feelings. And I start crying. I don't know why I'm weepy so much here lately. But I said, that's a knucklehead thing. I said, we've been married long enough that I ought to be a little bit more sensitive to how you take what I say, even though what I'm saying may not be wrong, but I'm not thinking it through because I know your feelings on it. And I need to reword my, uh, my, my communication to you. I need to restructure that. I need to be sensitive to you. And uh, there was a long pause, and she said, I appreciate you saying that. She said, I love you. I said, oh, I, I love you too. So we all do knucklehead things, don't we? And we just have to, we just have to repent, you know? Nothing wrong with repenting. Matter of fact, I think the church would be a lot farther ahead if we repented more. Sometimes we're like Fonzie. We just can't hardly say, I'm so, 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 so. I'm so, 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 so. <laughs> you don't get the sorry out, you know. But we need to be repentive. Every moment of every day, examine our hearts. What are we thirsting and hungering for? Now, this doesn't mean that we take ourselves out of the world. It means that we live in the world and that we ought to be seeking to live righteous lives among our co-workers, among our friends, those that we consider our peers, and yes, even those that we may look at as enemies whose lives may not be characterized by righteousness. Lost people, that not only are they lost, but they're mean-spirited to those that are saved. They're hateful of the church. They're hateful of God. And they just as soon do you harm as look at you. And there's people out there like that. But are we living righteous lives? Are we hungering after righteousness and thirsting after righteousness in the presence of even our enemies? So the question is, what are you hungering, thirsting after in your life? As followers of Christ, I want us to be able to assert without hesitation, righteousness. If you ask that question, what are you hungering for? What do you most desire out of life going forward in 2021? Oh, that's easy. Righteousness. We don't think about that very much, but it is. It's righteousness. And it's hard for us to say that we want to be more righteous because then it comes across as what? As self-righteous. And, and, but that's, there's a difference between seeming self-righteous and really pursuing the righteousness of God. Now, according to Christ... The righteous are not those who are able to outline their goodness. That would be self-righteousness. The Pharisees had a tough time of living without proclaiming their self-righteousness. But the righteous are those who are convinced of their badness. And they've run to God. Remember the man in the Bible, he said, Oh, Lord, I'm a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. That's 
we're running to God. We're, we're not convinced of our goodness, but we are convinced of our badness. Adrian Rogers, uh, a preacher that has been gone for a few years now, but he said this. He said, the, the worst form of badness is human goodness. We're all about ourselves and what we've done, and we, we, we are our favorite subject to talk about. And it usually is an indication that we can't see very well because we have eye problems. I did this, I did that. And, and it blinds us. We have an eye problem. But the worst form of badness is human goodness. So the problem with man's righteousness is it leaves him with a false sense of security. He thinks himself to be acceptable to God when he really isn't. Now, the purpose of God's righteousness is found as Jesus reveals it. And as later on in the scripture, we're going to be looking at this in a few weeks. The purpose of God's righteousness is you are the salt of the earth. And you are the light of the world. What an amazing statement. You, are, he's talking to the church, the universal church. So you are the light of the world. If we bring it down to the uh, independent assemblies like us, it's the same thing. You are the light of the world. And you are the light of your world. If you're a Christian, you are the light of First and foremost, in your house, in your address, 1840 Charles Road, I am the light of my world. I am the light for my wife. My wife is a light for me. Um, our children are all moved away, but when we're around them, we become the light for them. We become the salt for them. So it, it's an individual thing. And, it, and again, it's, it's every moment. The, the righteousness of God, the purpose of God's righteousness is that we'll be the salt and we'll be the light. In other words, we're making a difference. The closer that you get to God, your hunger and your thirsting for righteousness gets you closer to God, the closer God gets to you, and the stronger the light is, and it exposes the shadows. So the closer you get to God, the worse you actually see yourself. And you have to run to God for His mercy. For his righteousness. So don't be afraid to have the shadows exposed, but look for the shadows. Look for the darkness. Don't, don't retreat from God when you see him, but stand there, deal with those things, and advance even further in your relationship with Christ. You are the salt. You are the light. God's righteousness is for the purpose of leading others to righteousness. That makes sense to me. I'm the light of the world. So when I get around my family, I get around my friends, I get around my coworkers, I get around my peers, then the purpose of my righteousness is to lead them to righteousness. Are you leading others to righteousness? See, we're, we're kidding right back to that making converts. God's righteousness knows nothing of allowing others to stay in sin. In our uh, meeting this week, the subject was brought up by a, a fellow pastor about um, the situation going on in Shelby where transgenders and different ones are meeting at this certain church and um, being affirmed in, their, in the condition that they're living their lives in. Uh, and he was so concerned about that. And he was almost, uh, you know, he was passionate, and it, but it come across almost a little bit angry, and he, he apologized for it. He said, you know, I'm, I don't mean to be angry, so we, we talked about that for a while. And I said, as Christians, we need to, to have the wisdom from God to be able to speak to those folks that are living a life that has missed the mark, that God has set a mark out there, a target, and He wants us to hit that target, a relationship between a man and woman, married, going forward. That, that's, that's the target in, in sexual gratification relationships. So if they've missed that mark, then they need to repent. 
and we share with them the good news of God in a way that, that's not the ugly Christian. And they can do what they want to with it. And I, I told the folks, I said, there's, there's two things there that we're dealing with. One is those that are uh, terribly uh, lost in their direction and need help. And the other is those that are firming their situation and actually making it worse by consenting, by marrying them, bringing them into the church. And I, I said, that's, that's a whole different ballgame. I said, the Bible speaks very explicitly about those who who encourage the works of darkness. And I believe that there are special places in hell reserved for those. Now, you, you might say you're a pastor, but I'm telling you right now, you care nothing for the flock of God if you're affirming a situation that the Bible explicitly talks against. So there's, there's two things. One is, one is we, we try to love those that are, that are misguided. And for those that are Affirming that, then that's something that we, we have no fellowship with the works of darkness. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, we that are righteous needs to uncover the works of darkness, reprove them. But we're living in a world where it's almost like anything you say can be offensive. Well, I, I just don't like green grass. Well, we need to put you in jail, <laughs> you know? So we, we, have a, we have a dilemma on our hands. We preached this a while back about the two things that's really coming against the church. So God's righteousness knows nothing about, of, of allowing others to stay in sin. We, we want to encourage. Even those that are affirming, they could repent. They could repent. Why they're where they're at, I don't know. I do know that in the um, seminaries across America, that they have a very liberal slant, very liberal uh, stance on these things. And it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. Uh, we have a church in our area, and a good church, good people go there. I know some of the folks who go there, but they don't have Father's Day. They have Man's Day. I know. They have not Mother's Day, it's Woman's Day. Because they don't want to offend. And I, I can't even get my mind around that. It seemed like it's such a silly little thing. God's righteousness knows nothing of allowing others to stay in sin. No such thing as a person who is righteous that doesn't lead others. There's one that can challenge you. But it's true. If you are righteous, the more you thirst and hunger after righteousness, the more that you're going to be compelled and convicted to lead others into righteousness. And that's good. The Bible says in the book of James, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good works, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Down here, we hunger and thirst after righteousness. But there's going to come a day when there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And the Bible says, in that new heaven and new earth is where righteousness dwells. So when we're hungering and thirsting after righteousness, part of that is we're hungering and thirsting after a better country, after a better land, citizens of heaven, a place where righteousness dwells. I, I like that. There should be a yearning in all of our hearts to go to a place called heaven. Not that we dive off the board into it. God will get us there in due time. But there should be a yearning in our hearts to go to that, that wonderful country, that wonderful place where righteousness dwells. The harvest of righteousness 
that verse that we just read in the book of James, is sown in peace by those who make peace. Through asking and receiving the wisdom from above that is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits. It's certain and it's sincere. It's not manufactured. Righteousness is the key. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, For our sake, God made Jesus, God made Jesus to be sin, who knew no sin. We could just stop there and, and, and dwell on that for a couple of hours, couldn't we? The perfect way that had to be established that we might become the righteousness of God took the Son of God to be made sin. He had no sin. He was perfect without fault. There, were, there was nothing in him that was, that was bad. But God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin. And the only reason he did it Paul continues, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Praise God for that. We had no hope. No matter how good we were, no matter what we had intended to do, we just had no hope. God gave the perfect sacrifice so that in him, in that perfect sacrifice, we might become the righteousness of of God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. Get a chance to read several verses before that and after that. I would encourage you to do that. But what Paul was saying here at the end result in this, the, the B part of the verse 7, he said, no matter what the attacks were, this is Paul's thinking here, no matter what the attacks were or against which hand they attacked, from the right hand or the left hand, Paul resorted to righteousness. He resorted to what righteousness? Not, not, um, not an emotion of anger or I'm going to get even, uh, but he resorted to righteousness by the armor of righteousness. Paul proclaimed that he stood in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. How could he proclaim that? Because God made him that knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Paul took that verbatim. He stood in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Then he committed his life totally to the Lord Jesus Christ. That hungering and thirsting comes in there. He committed himself to live a life committed totally to the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you follow his life, Paul's life, you see the maturing. You, you, you see him becoming more and more as a, um, not only a partaker of righteousness, but one that leads others to righteousness. And through his testimony and words that he's written to the churches, he is leading us today in 2021 in righteousness. He behaved righteously for the sake of the ministry. Oh, that we might have the sake of the ministry in our mind, in our hearts, as we live out our lives and our experiences and the circumstances of life that may not always be the best. See, the circumstances of life is... Uh, my dad could not run out in the backyard, grab me by the arm, and whoop me back into the house, through the garage, through the kitchen, up the stairs to my bedroom now. The circumstance of life is that, that dad is no longer a uh, 32, 33-year-old man, but he's 85. And I could do to him what he did to me. I wouldn't, I don't even like thinking that. <laughs> but that's a circumstance of life. 
One out of every one, one, one out of every one person that's born is going to die. Heard a guy say one time, he said, you know what? Uh, he said, all the wars combined never killed any more people than would have died anyways. And I thought about that. And I thought, that's true. Matter of fact, all the folks that have died in wars probably prevented who knows how many hundreds of thousands of people of being born and dying anyways. It's like, oh, wow, Kevin, that's kind of deep. It's not really it's just like, oh, it's just crazy. I thought it was kind of deep when the guy said it. Oh, I never thought of it like that before. But it's true. We're all going to die. We're all terminal. So we need to live our lives for the sake of the ministry. We need to live our lives righteously. Second Peter, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. And it continues, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Here's this verse we looked at a little bit ago. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. I like that. So that's a little continuation of last week's message, a little bit of review. And now we're moving forward. Um, and the verse continues here in the, these Beatitudes. He says, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Now we, we've got a, I, I want to read this uh, story in the book of, of Luke. And I, I, I want you to, to, to really, uh, it's, it's on your handout, it's not going to be on the board, but the picture of the, uh, it's supposed to be representative of Christ's foot being washed by the tears of, of a woman who did not have a very good reputation. Some folks think that it may have been the woman that Christ showed mercy to when the Pharisees brought her because they caught her in the very act of adultery. And the story ends in the fact that Christ said, where's your accusers? And she said, I have. She's getting ready to be stoned. She's getting ready to have her life taken from her in a very ugly way. I mean, how, what could be any worse than having rocks pummeled on you by people? until you died or you passed out and then died. Um, but he, he said, I, I don't accuse you either. He said, but uh, he said, go, live your life, enjoy what God the Creator has given you, but don't, don't be sinning. Don't sin no more. Stop, stop doing that. And... Um, it, it's a, it's a heart-wrenching story, and it shows the mercy of Christ in the midst of the obstacles of the self-righteous church, synagogue. I don't call it church. It's the religious people of that day. Um, so, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, this happened... Uh, that Jesus was with a Pharisee, and this Pharisee's name was Simon. And the Pharisee requested, invited Jesus to come and dine with him because he thought he was doing Jesus a favor to, to help him, to help him to rub elbows with the elite religious establishment. And when Christ came, there was a woman who showed up there also. And this is the account in the book of Luke. 
And it says, one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house, and he reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at, at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, in his mind, he thought this, if this man were a prophet, if he, if he was really a prophet, if he was who he says he is, then he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him. For she is a sinner. And Jesus, now he never spoke this out loud. He just said it to himself. And the next verse says, And Jesus answering, answering said to him, Jesus is answering his heart. Jesus is answering his thoughts. And he said, Simon, I have something to say to you. And Simon answered and said, say it, teacher. Simon had no idea what Jesus was getting ready to say. So he was probably, oh, say it, teacher. He said, a certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Simon, you got it. You judged rightly. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, I, I, I really hope, and I think it will be, that when we get to heaven, we can watch these things play out. I mean, we have movie cameras, and we take film, and we watch them. And I know that that is far advanced. Christ, and I, I just, I, wanna, I want to see the love in the eyes of Christ as he looked at the woman while speaking to Simon. And the verbiage that he was speaking to Simon brought condemnation. At the same time, the love of heaven was being shown to the woman. I want to see that scene. I want to see the eyes. I want to see how it plays out. Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. Now he's looking at the woman. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased, ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, all the while looking at the woman, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And then he changed his conversation from Simon to the one he was looking at. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. They're wiped away. They're removed from you as far as the east from the west, never to be brought back in judgment against you again. Now I'm paraphrasing, but I'm throwing in some other scriptures that he did say and he does affirm. He said, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And Christ continued, in spite of their bantering. And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Later on in another gospel, he said, this, this will be preached this memorial every time it's preached. 
It will be a memorial for what she did. And there's a lot of things we can go in a little deeper with that, but it's just suffice to say that Christ is so different than anybody else in all of creation. And he is to be the example of what we should thirst and hunger for. The mercy that he showed folks. So Simon was a Pharisee. The Pharisee requested he come and dine. But he was getting more than what he bargained for. With her tears, she wet his feet, dried it with the, the hairs of her head. And all Simon could say was that this guy was a prophet. He'd know good and well what kind of woman this is. And he wouldn't let her do that. <laughs> Christ said, she knows who I am. I have the ability to forgive sins. I don't hate people in their darkest moment. And no doubt she's lived some very dark moments. You didn't kiss my feet. She just kept kissing them. She's cleaning my feet. And you know why she's doing that? Because she's received mercy. Somewhere along the line, this woman and Jesus, they cross paths. Somewhere along the line, this woman was struck by the love and the forgiving nature of Jesus Christ. He told Simon, he said, you, you don't love me because you don't think you need mercy. And that's true. Matter of fact, all he could do was condemn Jesus because he couldn't possibly be who he said he is and let this woman touch him. They was like, what? <laughs> Who can forgive sins except God? Exactly. My name is Jesus. The Lord saves. I am Emmanuel. The Lord is with you. That's the story. That's, that's the story all wrapped up in a, in a nutshell, as they say. Hungering and thirsting at the righteousness. Loving mercy. Are you merciful? Do you love mercy? Now, we've mentioned this last week about Micah when we talked about hungry and thirsting after righteousness. We talked about it a little bit this week, but I actually brought this verse up. In Micah, he's, oh man, you know what to do. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly. And that word there, uh, love mercy, that means to be, in spite of what the situation is, in spite of who you're dealing with, whether it's somebody that loves you or somebody that hates you, the word love mercy means to be loyal with your kindness. To be loyal with your kindness. Mercy and kindness are inseparable. They're the same. In other words, you can't do somebody bad and have mercy on them. They're inseparable. Be loyal with your kindness. You don't get to pick and choose who you're kind to like Simon did. When we realize our condition and we run to God, God extends mercy. After, after you've been born again, after you've accepted the fact that God gave His Son that committed no sin, made Him sin, that you might receive the benefits of, of not appearing sinful because of the blood of Christ, even after that fact, we can do something boneheaded. And He says, I've got you covered I write unto you, little Christians, I write unto you, little children, don't sin, don't sin, don't sin. Oh, but if you do, 
that same blood that took care of the air of your ways is still in full effect. <laughs> you have an advocate with the Father, which is Jesus Christ. Go repent. And Christ sees Christ as the advocate on your behalf. And God has never, ever ruled against the advocate. <laughs> I'm glad for that. I'm glad for that because we all do boneheaded things. Some of them we don't mean to. And some of them we're just so upset or so impassioned about whatever the circumstance is, we go into it eyes wide open. But there's no... There's, there's no prerequisites there. He just says, look, don't sin, but if you do, you have an advocate. I love that. In other words, we have somebody that is showing us mercy. How many times is that mercy in effect? A lot. He tells us seven times seven in one day, and it's like, oh, wow, that's a lot of mercy. So we're to extend mercy to those that mistreat us many times in many ways through the course of our life because we have mercy. These aren't easy messages to digest, but they will cause you to get closer to God, expose shadows, and put you in a better position to lead others to righteousness. We're going to ask you to stand.